A bond among friends is special. A bond with family is sacred and should not be broken. What happens when your family member breaks that trust in death? Meet the family who cannot speak of their own horror and how that cord was broken, if you dare. It's the case of Thomas O'Dell, right now on Love and Murder. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to an all new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong. And when I say terribly wrong, how wrong do I mean? She means dead. D-E-D. Dead wrong. I am your host, Kai, and this is my lovely host, the illustrious, the gorgeous, the... I can't it's think of Charest. anything else. Yeah. Superstar Charest. <laughs> Superstar Charest. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another fabulous episode of What? Love and Unfortunately Murder. Why don't you sound like so happy when she says that? Well, no, not the last part. I said an unfortunately murder. Yeah, you said unfortunately murder. That sounded kind of <laughs> happy. <laughs> Didn't really go with unfortunately. I can't help it. I'm just a happy person, even when it's sad. So oh, good Lord. <laughs> Our show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery, suspense, and just a little bit of humor sprinkled on top. But what, Char? But never at the expense of the victims. That's right. Download Good Pods and subscribe to Love and Murder over there, as well as check out other indie podcasts. Good Pods is good for both iOS and Android, so you can listen on the go without trying to figure out where to get your next podcast. Tonight, we're talking about the case of a disturbed teenager and what he felt he needed to do, what he decided to do. We always say decisions are what makes the person. Let's see what his decision said about him. This is the case of Thomas Odell. But first, I'm going to give you my weekly reminder to listen to our last episode. Well, this time it's going to be two. And actually, last week we didn't record because both Shar and I were not on the same page. You know, with Shar moving and everything, and last week uh, I had visitors, so we couldn't get on the same page as to when to record. Yeah, it, so, we tried. <laughs> yeah, I actually did an episode. I did do an episode. I had a special guest on. We did an episode, but then with everything going on on my side, I didn't even get to edit it. And what we're just going to do is that episode is going straight into our Patreon. So that's Yay, what's going to happen. Patreon. So instead, I'm going to remind you to listen to our episode previously, which just two episodes, the case of the Harrison family murder. It was such an insane case that, like I said, it took us two episodes yes, to cover the entire lot thing. lot to cover. Oh, my God. And people are saying so much about it. Everybody's angry about the second half. Not angry at us, but angry at the outcome and the reason for the mm-hmm. outcome. Mm-hmm. So if you want to share this anger, <laughs> check out episodes share 52 and us. 53. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, but you have to start at 52 to be able to, like, understand where everything is coming from so the harrison family murders episode 52 and 53 these were disturbingly interesting cases and you'll see why if you check them out yeah and in our exclusive community we have a couple of bonus episodes for you our first serial killer corner with dorothea puente and another one where we talk about the ongoing case of johnny depp uh, we have one with Shar and I talking, and that one is completely just, dude, you might want to check that out because I was crazy. deliriously we tired. Kind of throwing it out there, poor Johnny. We tried. Oh, my God. It was <laughs> that 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 episode was completely just blah. We were just talking. And then we have another episode with a special guest star for if anybody who knows Shar and I from our old show. We have someone on there. Um, and that episode was more chronological the way I like the episodes. And also, we'll have another update to the Johnny Depp case. So that's coming out in a couple days. So if you want to listen to these two bonuses, plus more bonuses that we have in there, um, just go visit us at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And later on, I'll tell you more about what you'll get from joining this community. In the meantime, we're going to get right into this case. 
Thomas O'Dell was born on December 20th, 1966 in Mount Vernon, Illinois, to parents Robert O'Dell and Carolyn O'Dell. He was actually the first of four children, kind of like me. There were three boys and one girl, kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas's childhood was actually a really, really bad one. His mother, both mentally and physically, abused him and his little brother, one of the little brothers. That was, which is so bizarre to me. Like, I, this, this is what I don't understand about certain people. Like, why do you only choose, like, how would I put it? Why do you only choose some children to abuse and the others right okay they're with. just you they're treated perfectly or just you know normal childhood type of thing you're going okay how yeah, does I a don't... parent do that i always wondered about that because i hear about how do you isolate which I... one okay i'm just going to really make this this child's life a living hell that's what i'm saying and i don't understand other, it oh we'll just give them pot lollipops and you know marshmallows all day and then the, this one over here we'll treat them like the demon seed i i just I, I'm with you. I don't get it. I, I don't, I don't even think there's a method it. to the madness, but I, I see it in here. These cases uh, often where that's just what happens. Yeah. And then the kids grow up like, but why? Why me? Well, what did some I ever kids do? grow up like that. Like, they don't understand why their siblings were targeted, and some kids right. just they feel a superiority complex to their oh, other siblings. Really? So it really depends on the individual. Some of them feel sympathy, and some of them feel like just a superior superiority complex. Well, so, you can't again, really blame them because I would feel like, well, maybe I'm. I the do better blame kid. them because you can grow up into an adult and understand what was happening. Once you're an adult. I blame you for your choices <laughs> as a child, <laughs> as a teenager, maybe even a really, really young adult. No, because you're still coming into this world and trying to really wrap your head around everything as an adult. No, no, you you can understand. You can go back, realize like it's a bunch of stuff. So, no, as an adult, you are responsible for your choices you can't really continuously all your life go back and blame mom and dad in my opinion anyway so I just don't understand how some parents and I guess it's just I mean it's just like I can't understand how parents abuse their children in the first place so I guess that's maybe an abusive right. mentality pitting them against mm -hmm. each other I don't know but anyway so she only abused Thomas and one of his little brothers so one of the things she did was that she made him raise all three of his siblings, which that's kind of harsh. But to me, that's not abusive. Um, but then she also changed him to his bed sometimes. And she would also constantly tell him that she hated him and she wished that he'd never been born. Oh, no. Yeah. Which is like, well, I don't know. I, I have words for her, but whatever. <laughs> he also wasn't allowed to have friends to go over to his house or he wasn't allowed to go over to anyone else's house. So basically she just like totally isolated. Yeah. As mm. a matter of fact, he wasn't allowed to go anywhere other than school. So it was just always home, 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 home raise your, school, raise your siblings. And, and mm -hmm. then I wish you'd never been born and everything like that, which, you know, you sadistic. Mm, I'll keep that to myself. Well, when you say raise the siblings, do you have the ages apart or the dis like how, how close are they in age? Because a lot of kids are put in that position, but it's not as a punishment. It's just because uh, either the mother is just literally not around because she's working so many jobs and there's no father. But was it like a big difference in their age? Because I'm saying, why can't two of the kids, you know, help out with the house and food and you know feeding them shopping whatever i don't know it's not like he's going to be looking over homework and and tell you know having teachers conferences okay but. so in terms of difference of ages thomas was born in 1966 then his sister robin she was born in 1971 then his brother sean which is the one that his mother, the other sibling that the mother would abuse. He was born in 1972. And oh. then his last brother, Scott, like was born in years. 1975. So they were all five. They're five, six and eight years or something in between. Yeah. Because it's like, OK, that's kind of crazy because. Oh, OK. Well, I don't know. It's just crazy. I mean, the I can't find any logic here. I don't know why I'm trying. I'm just thinking, though, know, why? <laughs> even if, why even why, if they why? were very close in age, abuse there's no, no logic that's to not that what i mean oh you no, mean raising no. them 
Yeah, so my my this is where my mind goes. I I've heard of this story so many times where parents just designate a child to raise the kids because either a they're too lazy to do it, b they don't want to do it, c they literally are just not home because they have to work all these jobs to take care of all those kids, and they they just it just happens. They just kind of throw the responsibility to the oldest. But my thing is, why can't it be like, hey, you Sally and Gina, you're going to take care of you know these other two, but to have that all the responsibility on one child. It just seems so awful. Uh, look, I that, know you don't have a childhood. I know people and then, are and then gonna, you're being abused. I mm-hmm. know people are going to jump on me for my thought process. Uh oh, here's I, Kai's thoughts. <laughs> random Kai's <laughs> random thoughts. <laughs> I don't think children should be raising children in the first place. Helping out I with guess. certain things, completely, totally, yes. Children raising children, like a bunch of people tell me, you know, it's a good time to have another kid. Your child's a teenager now. She'll be able to take over yes. the diapers or take over that. this and i'm like absolutely yes. not That's no not fair. she doesn't have children i decided right. to have a second child exactly. so no she wouldn't be able to take over anything because she's a child herself she's gonna have a childhood so i completely do not believe in it that i completely do not agree with that of course would i have her help yes yeah so she this can is learn, how she you know, learned exactly bit, but me you know. just being like well you know Here's your brother or sister. Have, you know, have at it. Raise them. Be home from yeah, school did, to make sure that you can homework? take care. Did you iron his clothes yeah, for school that's, tomorrow? Like, that's absolutely not happening. Did he take his vitamins today? Happening. Did you make his breakfast? That is Seriously, absolutely not happening. There's a lot of parents that do that. I know. And completely, and I completely. don't agree with it. To the point wow. where, like I said, people tell me now's a good time to have another one because she can, yeah. you know, help raise it. I'm like, yeah, because she's old enough to help. Yeah, I mean, I'm I like, hear this no. All the time how about the parents raised yeah. together? No, that's mm-hmm. why you have a husband. And if you didn't have a husband, then I mean, that's another story. But... Again, to be not for somebody to jump down my th- my throat, but that's something that you decided. That is not anything you should put on your children. As an adult, you decide how to take care of that. You don't say, hey, well, you know, we're the only, I'm the only one here. You know, your father's not here or whatever. So you're going to have to pick up the slack. Are you serious? No, they're kids. Seriously? Yeah, and what about, what about the parents and mothers that every other couple of years she's having another one and then throws those right under the, bu- under the bus with the, you know, the one she's assigned to take care of them. I mean, you imagine never having a childhood because you, you had to raise your own siblings. And of course it makes a lot of siblings closer from what I've heard before, you know, with stories like that. But I would just be resentful as ever. I would be so resentful. You know, like, well, what? I just, I just didn't experience anything I was supposed to well, as a child. We will talk more about this because it goes into both Shar's and I's background. We'll talk more about this in our Patreon. But I know y'all came here to listen to a case. So we'll finish the case. But if you want to hear more about our thoughts on this and why our thoughts are this way in the background of our childhood, then head on over to our Patreon. But we're going to go back to the case. (laughs) That's a great idea, Kai. I think we should. Okay, so yeah, so he wasn't allowed to have friends. He wasn't allowed to go anywhere. And there's actually one story of him going to school with, check this out, his shirt was soaked in blood. Now, I have two questions. <laughs> what? I have two questions. The first question is, what Who's could blood? a school-age child be doing where they're, they go to school with their clothes yeah. soaked in blood? Can you tell me? Can you tell me what a school-age child could possibly be doing? Anything? I got nothing. Nothing? Okay. I got nothing. Well, the shirt was soaked in blood because the whip marks on his back bled through. That's oh why it was God. soaked in blood. Now, okay, this- so the better question is, where, what are the teachers doing about this? Did they say anything about that in the story? Someone has got to notice. Well, that kind of led into... Okay, so first of all, let me ask this question. What grade do you think he was in when this happened? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with fourth or fifth grade. You're close, but so far. He was in kindergarten. What? Oh, stop it. Kindergarten. That so little... like a five, six year old. This oh, happened. that's so sad. Where the oh whip marks on his back bled through his shirt, which then led me into my third question, which is the same thing Shar asked, which I did say I had two questions, but I guess I have three. <laughs> how <laughs> were the cops not called or how was CPS not called? Or Who how would the teachers just let even, the child you know? go back home after seeing this? Then my other question, I guess this is four questions now. 
<laughs> what about the father? Where was the freaking right. father? Father. Oh my god. So in terms of, the, I, I kind of have questions to all of this because I had to, I had to look this up because I was like, well, where was this? What happened to this? And I wanted to know. Well, that's so, me over here. I'm like, I've got questions. I don't yeah. know. I have so many questions. So actually, it's so crazy. According to reports, his father was just he was an enabler. So the mother's oh. here, the mother's here uh, abusing the children and his father just sit back and let right. this happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, listen to your mother. Well, you know, maybe if you hadn't dropped your plate. Well, if you yeah. had eaten your eggs this morning. You got your neck sliced up today. You yeah. Know? That's basically the father. He just let it happen, which to me is just that's as bad abuse. as the abuser. Just mm-hmm. as it is. You, when I had my daughter and I looked into her precious eyes. And I just saw you look at a baby and they just rely on you. And I, yeah. at fr- from that time, I mean, before that, but really from that time, I couldn't understand how people abuse children. Mm-hmm. I could not understand it. Yeah. And you know why people probably didn't do anything also like the cops and everything like that. The school didn't call the police. The school didn't call CPS. Well, that's because when I researched Caroline was actually considered an, quote, upstanding member of the community. Yeah. So because you see her as an upstanding man- member of the community, yeah, she could that's all obviously say, yeah. be a tyrant mm-hmm. at home. Mm-hmm. She was actually the president of the PTO. Remember the PTO parent teacher organization back in the day? That's what I just said about the little kid. One of the kids, I said, well, he's not going to be going to the parent teacher meetings. Yeah. You well, know, she, as, was, as a, she was the president the guardian, of the like, PTO. <laughs> what? Yes. Uh, so to me, it's like, okay, so she's the president. She's an upstanding member. So his blood soaked shirt must have been from him. What falling downstairs and boys will be boys. You know, what, what, what was going through their head? Like, I just, I don't understand people. Sometimes you see well, who joins a the child PTO that doesn't like children though. You see it's all about a lot kids. of people. What are you talking about? It's a bunch of like, it's a facade. It's yeah, a complete facade. Clearly. Or she could have been there for the other two children that she supported. I don't know. Yeah. But who cares while she was there? My thing is everybody else. You saw a five or six year old come to school with a blood soaked shirt. And when you realize it wasn't because he was playing trucks too hard is because he had whip marks on his back. Wow. That little you're child. nothing, nothing. You just had him change his shirt and go right back home. Are you serious? Anyways, the physical abuse stopped when he grew up because by this time he was big enough to fight back. Yeah, I was just going to say. Right? But bring then it on, the, mama. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it hit me. Come, come. <laughs> but the emotional and verbal abuse never stopped, which is just as bad. Oh, yeah, because you, when you may not heal from those. parents are doing you know, this to insults. you, just mm-hmm. as bad as physical abuse. So because of all of this, Thomas grew up as a troubled teenager and he ended up turning to drugs and legal activities like, yeah. So the illegal activities he did was like, you know, petty theft and stuff like that. Just small things. But one time his siblings were actually removed from the home when Thomas was old enough that he went to the teachers himself He went to the school and he told them that he wasn't given food and that his mother had changed him, chained him to the bed. And then she left for the day. So I guess the blood uh, soaked shirt wasn't enough. But I guess now he's old enough to say, hey, you know, we weren't given food and I was chained to the bed for a day while she went out and went shopping. And so they were removed from the home for a little while, but they were sent right back. So nothing, literally nothing was done still because they still went back to the house. So like I said, he, he, uh, he turned to drugs, alcohol, illegal activities, all of this. And he was just a depressed young man because of all of the abuse he suffered. And I could only imagine that. Yeah. But another thing that was cited was he said he had a lack of, quote, emotional co- connection to his family. He also said that he hated rules and he hated laws, which is probably why he ended up turning to illegal activities, basically in boycott of the things he hated. You know, he hated the laws and he hated rules. So he stole. And he did everything that was opposite of following the rules. You know what I'm saying? Well, you're not fearing jail. You know, the consequences also. I think I don't think it bothered him. I mean, I mean, if your mom is whipping you 
to the point, I, I guess, you're not getting food. You're not going anywhere. You're basically in jail. So I guess he yeah, was so just like... Yeah, so at least in jail, you get three squares guaranteed. I mean, some people think that way, like, and they can't, like, it can't possibly be any worse than what I went through. Yeah, I know. Some people do think that way. Actually, I follow somebody who has stories about her life of abuse and everything like that. And she went to jail and that was her thought process. Can't be any worse. So anyways, um, in 1985, Thomas's parents had had enough. Enough of what? I don't know. And <laughs> and they out wanted him out question. of the house. My thing is, like, shouldn't they it be the enough? reverse? Like, he's yes. had enough, but <laughs> right. his parents I'm, had enough of, bleh, I don't know. the. Yes, you had I'm enough out. of the, okay. the, the person you raised, the outcome of the person you raised. Did you have enough of that? Is that what it is? No, they had enough of not being able to take advantage of him in the same way as they could do when he was vulnerable and younger. Well, his father, his father didn't take advantage or do anything. He just sat there. So, you know, I'm, I'm seriously trying to figure out what they had enough of. But anyways, they were like, eh, enough is enough, whatever. And they (laughs) wanted him out of the house. My question is though, where was his dad's resolve when it came to the mother abusing their kids? His dad put his foot down for him. I've had enough out of the house. But where was that when it came to the mother? <laughs> no, but like you said, if you're an enabler, you don't put your foot down about anything. I well, mean, he as sure, far as, far he as sure that situation. put his foot down about his son leaving the house. Yeah. But I guess that's <laughs> probably because the mother put her foot down. Yeah. <sighs> it was one less mouth to feed. Well, they barely fed him. So that shouldn't be an issue. Either way. Oh, I don't my like goodness. This, both whole, of them this is I crazy. Like. Mm mm. Mm. Anyways, November 8th, which is when they wanted him out, this day came around and, you know, his parents was like, all right, November 8th, you're out. By the time we get home from work, you better be gone. You better be gone. Get your stuff. So he woke up around 930 in the morning and he walked around the house and he saw that the only person that was there was his father. So, you know, he smoked a cigarette, took a shower, and went to find breakfast. One thing to note, though, the cigarette he smoked wasn't just a cigarette. So somehow, and I'm not saying this is laced in the cigarette because I couldn't find it anywhere, but somehow Mm -hmm. he'd also had some LSD that morning. So maybe it wasn't the cigarette. Maybe he just had it. But yeah, he'd also had, had LSD that morning. And then, like I said, he's in the kitchen. He ate breakfast, everything like that. Then on his way from the kitchen to his bedroom, he decided to take a six-inch bladed butcher knife with him. Really? Cliffhanger Kai's back with your reminder to subscribe so that you don't miss an episode and we'll be ever so grateful if you would leave us a five-star review on the platform of your choice. Also, come on over and join us at our exclusive LM community on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Once you become a subscriber, you get access to commercial-free episodes so you don't have to hear this particular interruption. Crazy Crime Corner, Love Obsessions, Serial Killer Corner, Relationship Advice, Kai and Char's Life Stories, like I was telling you in the beginning of this episode. If you want to hear more about our life stories, head to Patreon, Behind the Scenes, and so much more. Right now, we have a story of a nice old lady who wasn't actually so nice. We also have our views on this Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, because you haven't heard it everywhere else why not hear it from us as well? So if you want to hear that, then come on over and join us starting at only $3 a month. Don't miss out. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, hit subscribe and the notification bell in five, four, three, two, one. Now, if you did that, thanks for becoming an Ellen Emmer. And now, back to the show. A short while later, he hid the knife between his shirt and pants, came back into the kitchen, and stabbed his father in the right side of his throat. Wow. Robert staggered away, looking for the phone. He's like, where's the phone? Where's the phone? I guess, you know, he's thinking yeah, he's probably in shock, help. thinking to call 911 or thinking to call mm-hmm. his wife. I don't know. But, you know, he's staggering, looking for the phone and everything. But 
Thomas basically told him to stay away from the phone. So he's waving knife in front of him and like, stay away from the phone, get away from the phone. So his father just sat down in a chair. He just went to the kitchen, sat down to the, in a chair instead. And that's when Thomas decided to stab him again, this time in the left side of his neck. And then that wasn't Whoa. enough for stomach Thomas. So he stabbed him in the stomach as well. So mm. that's basically his father. So right side of neck, left side of neck, stomach. So Thomas knew that his mom was supposed to come home around 11.30 a.m. So he figured he would clean up. He dragged his dad's body into the bathroom and then put towels on the floor to cover up the trail of blood. He then mopped up the kitchen so that his mom wouldn't see anything out of the ordinary when she came home. And then when Caroline came home, what he did was she opened a door. He hid behind the front door and waited for her to cross the threshold. And then when she came in, he stabbed her in the back. And so she, you know, she's coming in. She doesn't know what's going on. He, she felt something in her oh, back. Yeah. She turns around. She sees him with a knife in his hand. So she starts running to the living room. All the time she's running to the living room, Thomas is chasing her, but he's stabbing her the whole time she's running. And wow. then, you know, she she's running around, whatever, whatever. And then he kind of gets her to get into her bedroom. And I'm thinking they had like a bedroom where the bathroom was attached. So when he got her into the bedroom, he told her, quote, look at dad. And it was at this point that, you know, Carolyn had lost a lot of blood, so she couldn't stand up anymore. And so she fell to the floor. And then Thomas dragged her to the foot of the bed and kept her, like, leaned her up on the foot of the bed, but she's still on the floor. Is she still alive? I didn't say if she was still alive after all of this. Oh. She probably was. She could have, could have been just bleeding out at this point in time, but oh. eventually she did die. Mm. After all of this, Thomas took off all his clothes. He threw them in the wash and then put on another outfit. By this time, it was 12 p.m. So remember, he woke up at 9 30. He had breakfast and everything. So say around 10, 10, 30, he did that to his dad. Then he waited for his mom to get home at what, 11, 30. And then by the time he did all of that, it's noon. And so noon came around. He changed his clothes, like I said, put his bloody clothes in the, in the wash to, uh, to get clean. And then he drove to the high school to see his girlfriend. His girlfriend's name was Teresa Blevins. And he went to the high school to go and chill with her. He stayed there for two hours and then he came home. So now it's around 2 p.m. And he started cleaning up the house. So remember, he cleaned up from his dad, put towels down. He didn't clean up from his mom. He just changed his clothes and left. So now he came home two hours later. So it's kind of dried blood all over the place. And he decided to kind of hurry up and clean this up because remember, his siblings are coming home now. So my thing is, as far as I know, blood is really, really, really hard to remove. So I'm wondering if he just yeah. kind of cleaned up a little one, a little bit. So kind of impossible to get all of it up, though, depending yeah. on yeah. So you and know, I don't it's think he like really sat there areas. with Clorox scrubbing or anything, right? No. So mm -hmm. that's that's really weird. I think he just like really like quickly cleaned up. So like if somebody stepped in the door, they wouldn't really notice anything right mm -hmm. away. So then, um, so he did that. So then three o'clock rolls around around three ten, his brother Scott comes home. So Scott is actually the baby. And around this time, Scott is 11. So he came home and he sees, you know, these red marks on the wall. He asked Thomas like, Hey, what's, what's all these red marks on the wall look like blood. Is that blood? And Thomas was like, no, of course not. Why would it be blood? This is paint. We were painting something and paint got on the wall. And then Scott, you know, started to ask more questions like, well, what were you painting? This is like, it looks weird. This doesn't look like paint. It, he's 11. He's not two. <laughs> Even an 11 year old can tell, though, that something's not right. Yeah. So he's <laughs> like, I don't, I don't. Okay. Okay. Well, you said this is paint. All right. So where's mom and dad? You know, because usually they're here when I get home from school. So where's mom and dad? And Thomas was like, oh, they went somewhere for the weekend and just left me here with y'all. So, you know, bummer, whatever, Which is whatever. nothing new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then he told Scott to go into the back bedroom, which is the bedroom that he shared with Sean. 
So it's the three boys in one bedroom. So he told them to go into their bedroom. Scott went there. And when they got to the bedroom, I don't know what in the frick is going through this dude's head. But when he got to the bedroom, he decided he was going to strangle Scott. So he's strangling an 11-year-old with his bare hands now. And he basically strangled him to the point where his hands, quote, became tired. Whoa. Like, what the frick, man? I have never heard of that. And so then because his hands were tired, he then got a pajama bottom and tied that around Scott's neck and continued to strangle him. Wow. That little kid's really suffered. Yeah. Yeah. And so then Mm -hmm. after he did that, he dragged Scott's body into his parents' bedroom and laid him next to his mother. So this is what I'm telling you, like at a certain point, you got to take responsibility for your life and you can't really like blame your parents for everything. So like, why are you bringing your siblings into this now? Like, no, because really? remember, I, but we talked about resentment. That's what we talked about. Resentment uh, dude, against the other siblings. Dude, you can resent people by saying, F you, I'm leaving. You want me out? I'm gone. And just don't talk to them again. You could resent them that way. <laughs> but no, but no, but these are feelings over many years of them being treated so great and normal, perfect even maybe. So what? And him that, being, that's you not know, their abused. fault. That's not their fault. But you can't rationalize that to someone that's your sibling and sees this every day. And, and you're co- constantly told that you're the bad seed. So I Once can, I mean, again, it, yes, I mean, people like that need counseling. I get it. But if you don't get that help, then what did you really expect him to, to think about his siblings? You can think what you want about your siblings, but you could also control yourself just because you resent them, just because your parents acted one way to them and a different way to you does not mean strangle an 11 year old. Well, I don't agree with his decision. I think it's ridiculous. Just for whatever reason you have, just stop talking to them. That's an option, too. He didn't think of that. Apparently. Okay. Well, anyway, so normally um, Caroline actually drives Sean, which is the third sibling, and his sister Robin home. So normally she picks them up from school and drives them home at around 3.30. So instead, since she's dead, he went and picked them up himself. And when they got home, he actually like blindfolded Sean so he's like you know I got a surprise for you here put this blindfold on and he went and took him into the bedroom where into the parents bedroom where the brother remember the little brother 11 year is old there, mm-hmm. the mother Lying is next there to the mother and then the, the father's, father's in the bathroom and mm-hmm. so then he tied his brother's hand behind his back with a towel now remember this is Sean this is the one that was abused just like he was so oh so you're so i get your logic like what does he have to do with this <sighs> i mean you're you both were in this together dealing with this type of what deranged does any life. of the children have to do with this this is my I don't question think it, uh, no i'm not i'm not condemning i'm not i'm not condoning i'm sorry what he did the decision he made with his 11 year old brother but i'm just saying i just don't get how he didn't realize that okay this one he suffered with me so why am i so angry <sighs> He was just angry, period. Yeah, yeah, well, I get it's, angry it becomes, too, so. It becomes I, not personal anymore. It's like if the, the poor cat was around, he probably would have done something crazy to the cat. So I, 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 it's like... You know, at first I was angry at his parents, which I'm still angry at them, but now it's just like it's turning to him because what in the actual blippity blip? But you should be angry with parents. You know why? Because they caused this. They this did their ca- fault. cause it, but at a certain point in time, you stop blaming your parents. You can take matters into your own hands and you can try and fix yourself. This is what I think. Now, everybody's going to come with me, at me with their opinions. You can come at me with your opinions, but this is what I think. At a certain point in your life, you can decide to get help. You could decide to fix yourself or you could sit here and murder your brothers who had nothing to do with anything. Like, look, I, I, I don't give excuses. It's just... Well, it's disgusting a hundred, all the way around. It's no it's just other way ridiculous. to look at this. Anyway, mm-hmm. so right now, Sean is blindfolded. He's in the room with his dead mother and dead brother. And then Thomas tied his hands behind his back with a towel. He then proceeded to stab Sean in the throat three times. And then stabbed him in the cheek and in the head. I'm supposed to feel bad for this boy. 
I uh, mean by the boy, uh, I mean uh, Thomas. I don't mean Sean. It's like when someone is super sick and they need help, you can't totally blame them because they're deranged and they need help. They're there's sick two, themselves. I mean, no, 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 no. There's like, two not different. Right no, mind, there's two different things here. If you're psychotic, like you, you maybe schizophrenia or something like that, you're not in your right mind. He is not psychotic. Okay, he drove up to the school. It was all premeditated. Like, I'm going to take my time and just walk, walk this in. I thought no, this it whole wasn't, thing through. It wasn't premeditated. Like, it wasn't premeditated. Well, we we but don't know that. We don't know if it wasn't. It doesn't he know sound what time like it was pre- home. I mean, he knows that he knows yeah. his family's schedule. I mean, all he does is sit at home. But yeah, but but he probably knew that he was going to have to go get his siblings from school, too. It was very thought out. So if you think if you could think things out from A, A to Z in a murder with all these people involved, then obviously you're not that crazy. So I guess my theory doesn't make any sense at this point because he's in his he is in his clear head to think, OK, I'm going to do this to this one and this to that one. And they even to drag the other siblings back home. He could have just left them on their he own at school. He had time to calm and, down, to yeah, think, yeah, and just walk and away not and move just forward. He right. had a lot of time to calm down, to think, and not move forward. Even if you were saying your mom and dad were in a crime of passion because you know you just couldn't take the abuse anymore. Two hours went by where you chilled with your girlfriend. You had time to calm down. Yeah, yeah, you chilled. I mean, yeah. What the I, crap? Yeah. Why would the, the your siblings have anything to do with this? So whatever. And he Anyways, didn't kill the girlfriend though. That's no, interesting. No, just out of just out of sheer anger. Yeah, no, he didn't kill his girlfriend. He chilled with his girlfriend for two hours and then came back home. So anyways, um, yeah, after he did that, that with Sean, who was actually just as abused as he was, he then went to go find where his sister was. But after he left the room, as he's walking away from the new the room, he's hearing noises like in the room. So then he was like, what the, what is that? So he walked back into the room and he saw that Sean was still alive. So he went back to start stabbing Sean again. And he stabbed Sean in the head and he stabbed him in the back of the neck until he figured uh, he was dead. Uh, this uh. this poor little boy. He then decided to change back into the blue jeans he had on before, like when he, like when he woke up for the day. So he changed back into that blue jeans because now it went through the wash They're cycle and, and everything like that. And, yeah. yeah. And then he changed his shirt again so much time to calm down and think about what you're doing. He changed it. He went into the laundry room, got his his clean uh, jeans, changed his shirt, and then he went to find Robin. And when he found Robin, he told her to, you know, come on into the bedroom. You know, everybody's in the bedroom. Everybody's in mom and, da- and, mom and dad's room. And come on over. Let's go into the, uh, well, let's go into the bedroom. Are. So as he's walking back mm-hmm. there, he's like, you know, it's a surprise. So he put his hand over her eyes. You know, like, like if you're telling your, your siblings you have a present for them, so you'll cover their eyes for them so that you make sure that they're not peeking through. So he covered her eyes and he said, I have a surprise for you. And then when they got to the parents' room, he uncovered her eyes and literally showed her the bodies of her entire family, except for him. And uh. as she's standing there, like, you know, she's little. She's trying to process what's going on. As she's standing there, he stabbed her in the neck four or five times and once in her side. Like, I don't know. This, like I said, I, I have no, I have no, words. I have I, absolutely I just, no words. This I have no words. Is, oh. Mm. oh, wow. So then after he did all of that, I guess that's when he decided to calm down. And then he noticed he had blood all over him, which duh, he stabbed somebody in the neck. You know how much blood that would take? Oh, anyways. Well, the juggler vein is there. So that's definitely going to be a good yeah. fest. Yeah. It's terrible. So, it's so a lot of blood, and so he noticed that he had blood all over him. He It was also then that he noticed he had cuts on his hand, so he had cut up his hand. Well, when Most people that stab people end I up mean, with lots yeah, of Yeah, because you stab the head. The head is yeah. the skull. So yeah, so more than likely, hard, yeah, he's hard doing parts. that, his hand yeah. slipped off the handle and went onto the knife itself, onto the blade. Um, so, you know, he washed himself off in the sink. He again changed his clothes. Um, he locked up the house, 
And then he jumped in his father's car and drove around for about an hour. Then he called his girlfriend and he went and picked her up at a gas station that was near the high school. And he drove her, him and her to a motel and decided to spend the night at a motel. Then, Away from the crime scene. Yeah, okay. I mean, of course, he wants to spend a night with his girlfriend and he can't bring her to the house where there's blood everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't I don't understand this dude's logic whatsoever. And I no, really just want to see, you know, what's going to happen when it comes to the court, like how they're going to rationalize this, because to me, I don't rationalize it at all. The next day, because the father, Robert, didn't show up for work. You know, they sent, you know, this, when we got to stories where you didn't show up for work and they sent somebody to your house immediately, that's amazing to me because when I didn't show up for work, nobody came looking nobody for me. Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody called me. Nobody so, came looking no, for me. It's like, ah, like, oh, she'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. She's like, probably and just even at if home a reading week a book passed, or something. Even if a yeah. week passed, more than likely what they would have done is just fire me. <laughs> like they wouldn't yeah. have called me. You might have got a phone call from your boss, but not the cops. <laughs> they wouldn't no have one's sent any care. cops. Nobody would have come and checked yeah. on me. Like maybe my friends, but work. But anyway, I mean this is this is so this is so typical though in these cases. It's always oh yeah, because so and so that we noticed he didn't show up for a shift, and everyone said he normally wouldn't miss a day. I mean, even if you wouldn't miss a day, no one's gonna call. I don't get that. Like they're definitely not calling for me. I can be. I could do three sixty five on a job, and I miss or three sixty four, and I missed that that one day. The 365th day, no one's going to be like, we're Nobody is going to check on me. Oh, we're, we're so concerned. Yeah. Like, really? No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he didn't show up for work one day, which don't get me wrong. I'm not making fun of this. It's just amazing to me how you don't show up for me work too. one day. Yeah. And they just once. Can you can you 911? Can you do a courtesy call on Robert? He didn't come to work that day. So police went out to the house and that's when they discovered the entire family dead. And of course, Thomas was the only one who wasn't there. So he became the prime suspect. Like, how of come course. they're all there, but he's not and there? And you're, you're not. Exactly. So he became the prime suspect and they realized the father's car was missing. So they put an APD out on that car on the license plate. I mean, he could not be thinking this through. They of basically look for your dad's car. found him the next morning. So That's it was easy. like one, two, three, they found him. <laughs> yeah. And he course. was still at that motel. So they arrested mm -hmm. him. And when they asked him, he didn't deny it. He never denied that he killed his family. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So, you know, he was in that motel with his girlfriend. So the cops asked him, of course, like any cop would. Hey, does she know anything about this? And he was like, she has no idea. So she didn't even know she was sleeping with a sadistic With a serial murderer. killer. I wouldn't even call him a serial killer. He was just a sadistic murderer who killed children in a horrible, yeah. horrible way and killed his, yeah. his parents and everything like that. He said that the first time that she even heard that anything happened was when she called a friend from the motel the morning after all of this happened and the friend said, Hey, uh, the police are looking for Thomas because he was suspected of having killed his entire, entire family. She was like, what, what's going on, Thomas? This is what my friend said. Like, what are you talking about? And Thomas said, quote, she's crazy. You know, that crazy B I T C H. She's crazy. Hang up the phone. And she was like, oh. okay, <laughs> well, yeah. And that's it. So she heard, because of her friend, but because he was like, really, do you believe her? You know what I'm saying? Like, like, seriously, I think I would believe it because I'm a true crime podcaster. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, really, course. if you're like your friend is like, hey, yeah, the cops are looking for your dude. Uh, he killed his whole family. You'd be like, he was here with me the whole night. No, I don't. I believe know. I that. would think that, too, because it was, it was a certain. Well, okay, he was with, well, he was with me for a couple of hours. Yeah, but he didn't. But I'm not going to be like you know trying to trace it. Well, did he say he was going to go here or there? Me, when he left here and I'm gonna turn around and look him like, up and down. I'm gonna be looking for a <laughs> bunch of evidence. Who was yeah. on the phone? Let oh, me see no. your fingernails. <laughs> and I'll be like, he'll be like, who was on the phone? I'll be like, oh, you know, it's just my friend. She's just calling because you know her crazy boyfriend. And I'm gonna make up a whole story while I'm eyeballing you up and down. If I see one right. scratch on you, like, oh, I'm gonna go and get some ice and I'll be right back. 
I will <laughs> leave in my drawers. I don't care. <laughs> I'll be out. But anyways, um, like I said, so they're questioning him. He said his girlfriend didn't know anything about it. When her friend said this, he told her he was crazy. She was like, all right. You know, he never said he didn't kill them. He was like, yeah, I did it or whatever. He said what happened was that his parents had argued with him the day before. And when they asked him, well, what did y'all argue about? He said, you know, we argued about the same stuff we do every day. Same argument, different day. You know, we argued about the same stuff. It's just nonsense. You know, get out the house, do your chores. He said basically, quote, everyday nonsense they bitched at me for every little thing i did i look at them wrong what are you looking at me like that for constantly jumping on my throat constantly constantly pressuring me end quote and when he you know they asked him well how long has this been going on he said quote years and he said that you know at that time when they were having that argument that day his parents had told them you know you have, you have to find another place to live. You can't stay here. It's just, like I said in the beginning, we're done with your nonsense. But again, before he did all of this, my question was, what nonsense? You know what I'm saying? So they told him, like, like we said in the beginning, but they actually said, by the time your father, actually it was goats to work. So I guess his father works at night. So by the time your father leaves for work at 4 p.m., you better, you be, better gone. be gone. So, yeah, so it was basically like what we were saying in the beginning, except it wasn't come home. It was going to work when they so asked him. That was him, his motive. In other words, that's what it sounds like. Well, let's see. When they asked him why he killed his siblings, he said that, you know, once his parents were dead, well, there's not going to be anybody to take care of the kids. So, <laughs> oh no, I can't believe I laughed. Excuse me, listeners. We no, we're not. I'm, I'm gonna tell you. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me tell you why Char but laughed. That is crazy. Char didn't I laugh at the situation. It. Char laughed at the stupidity the of stupid, that answer. Yes, oh, America's my God. dumbest criminals. I, you know, I never expected to hear that. Uh, did you expect that he would say something like that? No, no, I that really like, didn't. It threw me for a loop. I'm gonna be honest, guys, because when she said. You literally said, let me let me get this straight. Well, who else is going to take care of the kids? I mean, remember, so, you know, that's his full responsibility. So in his mind, maybe he was being considerate of the well, fact I that mean, these poor kids would be. Well, I mean, you raised them all this time. Like Why not parentless? continue raising them? <laughs> well, that that would be oh, my question. Gosh. So, you know, that's what he said. It's so much easier to get them out the picture so they don't have to <sighs> suffer with no one to take care of them. Yeah, they just suffer with... Whatever. Actually, that doesn't make sense, Kai, because he was the parent for the most part. That's what so, I'm saying. So that doesn't make sense. That's what I'm saying. It was oh, you bullshit. know what, dude? That excuse was so. I said that's what lame. I said. He like, raised them this really? whole time. Yeah. What yeah. the hell? Are you serious? So anyway, when they ask investigators asked him, well, couldn't the kids have just lived with relatives or something? Yeah. You know, right? he said that the, the kids would quote find our parents and they would run and tell <sighs> what are you five are you freaking <laughs> kidding me uh so, so anyway run and tell what go tell that <laughs> yeah i mean what? basically they would have found his parents and they would have gone and tattletailed which duh are you serious Anyway, our big brother's not watching us because our grandma, grandma's watching us today. Like that's not a reason for no, a punishment. Well, what he's saying what is, instead of killing them, they could have just stayed with relatives. And he said, "Well, yeah, I guess, but they would have found our parents dead, and they would have run and told somebody." Oh, so he literally thought that if he can keep all the family dead in the house, no one would ever find out anyway. <laughs> In other words, right? That's it. That's it. That's that's I mean, I like that you said that because I wouldn't even, I I didn't even consider that. Yeah. They would tell. That's his whole plan. No one will ever find out because everybody's dead. dead. I guess nobody's going to ever find out. Yeah, everyone's dead. You can't talk. You know, people don't show up to work, to school. Yeah. Right. Makes sense to No one's ever going to come knocking at the door. No. Knock on the door. Are you crazy? Definitely not the neighbors or the cops. Oh, good Lord. (laughs) Anyways, so then... When the officers asked him, well, what were you going to do after you left this motel room? Like, what was your plan? He said he was just going to, quote, just drive, 
and find a pole to hit in or something. So basically he was saying he was just going to kill himself. He was just going to drive around and run into a, a light pole or something. So that was his, coward, that was coward, his plan. Coward alert. Wow. But uh, I hear what you're saying, but you're still alive. So how long were you going to wait yeah. to do this? You know what I'm saying? Why didn't you just do this in the first place and leave everybody else out of it? Not that I can to- yes. condone suicide. No, we're not condoning suicide. No, no but I'm but just, we're saying, just saying, like, why don't you just leave everybody else alone? Don't, yeah, don't j- take everyone down with yeah, you. Yeah, like, crazy. seriously. So, of course, he was arrested, charged with murder and everything like that. And they actually took this to trial, which I wouldn't have done a trial. I would have just been like, guilty. There's no need to. Why do they even have to bother? <laughs> so he was taken to trial and his defense tried to say insanity. That was the defense they were trying to use. To, put, to support this theory, his defense brought a bunch of testimony from friends, neighbors, counselors, CPS, just a bunch of people just to support that he was insane. Some of these people that they brought on from CPS, some of these employees themselves had actually, they were actually counselors to the family after, now check this out, after they had received reports that the family was physically and emotionally abusing Sean. So they were aware of the abuse. So if it wasn't even for that blood soaked shirt on Thomas and the fact that Thomas said, hey, I was without food and chained to the bed while my mom went out, they got reports that Sean was physically and emotionally abused. And they went out and they were counseling the family. Like, what the frick did you people need to take these children out of there? Are you serious? Uh, I blame CPS too. Well, these people here, I blame them. I don't blame the whole system. I blame this department of the CPS. Well, he's not the only one that's crazy. They wanted to contest that, that he was crazy. I guess they're the ones who are supposed to, you know, be the, be the, I guess the example, I guess the mouthpiece, like, yeah, he is crazy. They're crazy. Because how do you not notice this and do something about it? There's too many, too many opportunities, really. And the authorities did nothing. I, I just don't understand. This is, you know, it is very typical of, of homes that, you know, where abuse happens like that. It's always after the fact. People are looking around like, well, we kind of knew, but yeah, but you we know. didn't say anything. What is such, such a tragedy? Oh, my, Ugh. my favorite Everyone. It's such a tragedy. Like, well, why couldn't you have done something before that was such a tragedy? Don't you think child abuse is a tragedy? No, no, not really. That's the not enough of a tragedy to you. So anyways, some of the witnesses that were called were called to testify concerning the actions that were taking after Thomas was, you know, he, he, he had some felony charges against him and he was filed as an adjudicated delinquent for one count of felony theft, four counts of residential burglary and one count of attempted residential burglary. And for those who don't know what um, it means to be an adjudicated delinquent, according to JLC.com, quote, a delinquent act is an act that would be considered a crime if committed by an adult. When a child is found guilty of committing a delinquent act, he or she is an adjudicated delinquent, not convicted of a crime. So that's basically what happened in Thomas's case. So he committed these these acts, which were supposed to be felonies, but because he was a child, basically it wasn't considered a crime. So wow. all of the witnesses that were called, though, described the Odell family. They really talked about the parents' treatment towards the children, towards Thomas, towards Sean. So basically, it wasn't a secret as to what was going on in their house. So they talked about the treatment of Thomas and Sean. They also talked about how the parents treated the other two children. And then they really, like, honed in on Thomas's drug use, which, again... I call BS on all of y'all because nobody stepped in and protected those children from absolutely anything. And this, although particularly Thomas, although Thomas is wrong in how he handled it as well, Mm -hmm. this is this is one of the outcomes that could happen. And now you're trying to point towards drug use. Well, he was a drug addict, so you know. 
What did you expect? And why was he driven like, to really? that, you know, to drugs? Like he, he was disturbed Ugh. for many years, his entire life. And nobody cared, really. Nobody cared. And, you know, actually, speaking of other family members, where were these people? Where were these people? Because I'm pretty sure they knew that these children were being abused. Pretty sure. Yeah. But it's funny how this case is really quiet about them. Anyway, Dr. Henry Conroe, a psychiatrist, he ended up testifying on behalf of Thomas. He wasn't able to say that Thomas was insane, but he also didn't come out to say that he was sane. Uh, For the day of the murder, he had three questions, which were what he said essential to his diagnosis as to whether on that day Thomas was insane while he was slaying his whole family. And he said those three questions that he had were not answered. It, it, throughout the whole trial, these, these were not answered in his opinion. So his first question was, were you able to determine why Thomas murdered his, fam, uh, his father and Scott? But during the interview, he showed like that he really loved them. So it's like, okay, you murdered them, but at the same time, you're showing love for them. So he couldn't understand. Wow. He couldn't understand why that happened. So that was his first observation and his first question. His second, his second observation and question was that he was not able to determine why Thomas continued to murder his entire family while he, as Thomas put it, he said he felt nauseated and repulsed while he was killing the rest of his family. So he couldn't determine why Thomas decided to continue doing that, even though he felt that basically, because if you're feeling nauseated and repulsed, then you're feeling like you shouldn't be doing this. And like, why am I doing this and this and this and this? So he couldn't determine why this was happening. And his third question that he felt was not answered was what was Thomas hoping to gain from this? Like what were, what was your end result? What were you hoping to gain from murdering your entire family basically? So these are the three observations and questions that he said in his opinion were not answered during the interview, during the trial and everything like that. So this is why he couldn't say on the day of the murder, if Thomas was sane or insane. This is what Hmm. Dr. Henry Conroe said. Interesting. And so, like I said, during the interview, Thomas did talk about his father in a good way. He loved his father and everything, but he also had, he loved his father, but he also had, like he was angry at his father because he said his father was quote unavailable. And just like this passive aggressive guy, he was just like there. He didn't do anything for them. It wasn't yes, no, don't do this. You know, not stopping the, I mean, the wife from doing that, anything. He was just quote unavailable, yeah. which I could totally see this. I could totally yeah, see but this. You know, that's, that's also showing that you, that's the opposite of love. When you love someone, you actually care enough to show some kind of interest or interaction. The thing with Thomas is that he did love his father, but he was also angry at his father. Whereas his father, no, no, and I understand what you're saying. Whereas his father, Mm -hmm. I know you're saying that's the opposite of love. The way his father is, you know, I don't even want to say treating him because he's not doing anything. He's there's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah, you can't say treating him because treating him is doing something. Yeah. His father was just, he was just there. But that would make me angry, though. Exactly. Because I want to, like, slap you, like, snap out of it, do something, protect exactly, me. Exactly, exactly. Show that you're alive, that you care. I mean, it's hurting me just as much because I feel like you're almost silently condoning it, really. Well, I mean, he totally is. You're not trying. He totally is. Yeah. Um, which to me, I don't know if that's worse than the physical abuse because you're watching your parents sit there and let it happen, like... That that's also a form of abuse because you're just uh, that's like a psychological abuse. Yeah. So then Thomas in, during the interviews, Thomas described his mother as like she was two different people. You know, she was in the community. She was very in the community, active. She, shows one she was very yeah. happy. You know, people turned to mm-hmm. her for advice and, you know, people loved her. She was very well respected in the community. Like we said in the beginning, then she comes home behind closed doors and 
she's a completely different person. She's not a happy person. She's not a supportive person, at least to these two children. So it was the first one. She skipped the second one, the third one, and then she skipped the fourth one. So it's just these two children, Thomas and Sean. And she's just violent, so twisted. emotionally no abusive, physically abusive. And yeah. You know, I, I don't I don't understand. I can't even try to really figure out her, her logic because there isn't any. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Just so crazy. The doctor also testified that there definitely was evidence that Sean had been chained to his bed at night, chained to his bed at night. Wow. And that when Caroline hit the children with a belt to what she calls discipline them, At times, she was actually unable to stop herself. So who knows what that means? How many times that she beat them with the belt? She was unable to stop herself. Are you crazy? (sighs) She was possessed. I don't know. And no control. Also, it came out outside of her body. Like, I just can't. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. That's crazy. I I, I don't. mm, I don't agree with that. I don't know who this is. I bumped that. (laughs) Anyway, it also came out then when Thomas was younger, his mom had actually smashed his head into a wall and that Sean had told uh, CPS that his mom had, quote, taken a hammer to Tom. So she was beating him with a hammer, smashing what? his head into walls and stuff. And then she used a dog chain to tie Tom to his bed. And so at night, instead of him actually laying in the bed, he's just tied to the bed. So was Sean. Are you serious? Hmm. <sighs> so it's no wonder they were alive at all, you know. And these, it came out that CPS were alerted to this and they did not do anything. They had counseling sessions. That's what they did. They had counseling sessions. That's it. Uh, anyways, his court appointed lawyer, whose name is James Henson, Uh, During his closing argument, he said that his client was, quote, feeling sick and nauseated, like I said, as he was killing his family. But that didn't stop him. Like he felt like he had to continue on. He couldn't stop. He said, quote, something took hold of him. Something made him do it. That's what it was said in his closing arguments. Hmm. His lawyer also, you know, in the closing testimony, cited testimony from the psychologist, from psychiatrists, that Thomas was a victim of years and years of abuse by his crazy, sadistic, stinking mother. And, you know, that violence was the norm in the family. Every day he came home. This is what it was in the house. So this is what they're trying to uh, paint in their closing argument. Another doctor, Dr. Robert Hanlon said, quote, he was in a homicidal state of mind. There were two bodies. Both of his parents were lying dead on the floor. It was kind of like a freight train out of control. Kind of a nihilistic drug-fueled termination of the family unit, end quote. So this is what another doctor stated about the whole thing that's going on with Thomas. It was concluded that he didn't have schizophrenia. He wasn't bipolar, but he was really depressed at the time, which that like, how many people do you know that are really depressed? that don't go around killing their entire family. Right. You know, so that's what I was telling you in the beginning, Shar. I could see schizophrenia because you're like, for all we know, you're not even seeing what we're seeing. You're hallucinating a whole different dimension. And to you, your family could have looked like monsters that were coming to get you or the voices Mm -hmm. in your head told you something. That's literally the definition of insanity. Not that I'm insane. I'm saying that I could understand that. I could understand that in the sense of you're not in your right mind. You know what I'm saying? You don't even know that you did this. And by the time they give you medicine and then calm you down and you're brought back to reality. And then they're like, hey, you just killed your whole family. Like that's completely different. And then you look around like I did what? Exactly. That's completely different from somebody who it just turns out, ah, he was depressed. Are you serious? He was that he was depressed. I get depressed. Wow. I get significantly Everybody depressed. Does, actually, mm-hmm. I- I'm supposed to be seeing a therapist. I get really <laughs> depressed. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I don't think I could get away with that. I, I, I would to, never though. even remotely mm-hmm. think 
of killing my entire family. <laughs> like, oh, I my mean, God. it's crazy. I to get, kill one person, it would be on my mind. I, I wouldn't be able to sleep or anything. I would just, oh, I would. It just, it just seems. But all those people. And and not to mention that's your whole su- well not support system but it's everything that you know so you have no one else to lean on talk to like your siblings at least uh, you know there's none of that it's all it's all over I mean like I said he could have still just left the house he could have been severely depressed yeah. out of the house and you could have found yourself help or just whatever just get out of the house you just had to leave literally that's all you had to do but anyways I digress. So, quote. Yeah, deep breaths, deep breaths, Kyle. Like, this this whole breaths. episode is pissing me off. <laughs> Anyways. I know. It's, it's very disturbing. I, I do agree. Quote. It's very disturbing. He was not insane. He could understand and appreciate, despite the drugs he was using, the criminality of his conduct. He said, uh, Dr. Han- Dr. Hanlon said this was not a premeditated execution. So, it, that that goes against what you were saying, Shar. It was not premeditated okay. because can, he I said can accept that. he said, "quote premeditated and well organized execution are usually for financial gain." So, to, according to oh. him, and what he reported to the court was that this really? was an impulsive act. So uh, he says he also says people who commit impulsive acts usually tend to be mentally impaired or have psychopathic traits, like you know they lack remorse, they lack empathy or whatever but Mm -hmm. according to him thomas didn't fit any of this quote he was quite unusual which made which to me made this a very interesting case and worth exploring in depth end quote on may 29th 1986 a jury deliberated for less than two hours before finding thomas guilty of five counts of murder that shit would have taken me five minutes. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh my. But whoa, put me on the jury. With, wow. with jury, I mean, when you're doing stuff like this, you have to fill out paperwork and stuff. And I think that takes them mm-hmm. like about two hours to fill out the paperwork. So they probably did walk into the room was like everybody in favor of guilty. Everybody say aye, And they're like, all right, let's fill out the paperwork. So that's probably what happened because it does Maybe. take a while to fill out the paperwork. Because like I'm saying that would in court, I'd have been like guilty. Oh, yeah guilty oh yeah yeah yeah. guilty no 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 guilty guilty (laughs) that would have been me in court and the more (laughs) they went down the story it have been like guilty good god guilt hey can i just can we just deliberate please (laughs) (laughs) get this over yeah i I got stuff to do he's clearly guilty i don't even know why we're wasting taxpayers money here guilty anyway yeah guilty (laughs) what do you want for lunch (laughs) guilty Yeah, exactly. With a side of Coke or something. (laughs) (laughs) So the state requested a hearing to try and consider whether they should do the death penalty or not. And Thomas actually waived the jury. So the trial court found him eligible for the death penalty. So they were trying to go to trial to see if he should have a death penalty. Thomas was like, eh. I don't want to do that. So then they were like, well, fine, then you're eligible for the death penalty. And after hearing evidence in aggravation and mitigation, the trial court sentenced Tom to death by lethal injection. Now, at that time, he was only one of eight people in the U.S. since 1870 to be sent to death row for family mass murder. Since 1870, he was only one of eight people. Can you imagine that? However, this came around around the time where in Illinois, a bunch of people were actually found to have been wrongly convicted of, of, of certain crimes and erroneously put on death uh what do you call it on on a death sentence death row. yeah on death row and and erroneously convicted of stuff they didn't do and so it started causing a panic like how many people do you have on death row that shouldn't be on death row oh my god so at that point in time a moratorium of executions in 2001 ended up taking him off of death row and putting him in life in prison instead instead so then what yes so he ended up getting he was supposed to die but because i don't know i don't know what illinois was doing too many people were on death row who weren't supposed to be on death row they started panicking and they stopped death row and 
then so he got put on um, life in prison instead. And then that's when he wrote and I told you about a previous doctor and I erroneously said that he he um, he spoke at a trial. No, this doctor, Dr. Robert Hanlon, didn't sp- speak at the trial. Thomas actually reached out to him. He wrote a letter to this doctor and Dr. Hanlon was a neuropsychologist. He wrote a letter to him and what he was trying to do, Thomas, he was trying to understand, first of all, understand why he did it. And second of all, explain to somebody why he did it. So he reached out to somebody who figured could help him go through like his thought process of that day and why everything happened. So while he was in jail, he did feel remorse for what he did to his family. He couldn't explain to himself, let alone other people, why he did this to his family. And he felt he wanted help. So this is after 17 years, he wrote Dr. Robert Hanlon. And his whole thing was maybe if you figure out why I did this, this might help other people not do this. You know what I'm saying? So this might help prevent other tragedies from happening. So, so he didn't notice he needed help until this, all of this happened. I mean, after uh, all of this happened, that's kind of lame to me. Cause it's like, you know, that you needed help your entire life. And you had all those people, but that okay. maybe could have In helped. Terms if you said anything. Of this, I'm going to be on Thomas's side a little bit. You can't really say his entire life because children only know what they know. This is why when I said okay, you're an adult, true. That is true. you have no mm-hmm. excuse. Children I only know what they life. know. Yeah. Because then when you find mm-hmm. out, oh, with your friends or whatever, which he wasn't allowed to have really. But when you start right. talking to other no people and you're like, wait a second, you don't get so beat every day. Your house? Yeah. You don't right. get chained mm-hmm. to the bed every night. You actually, your mom hugs you? Are you serious? That's when you start realizing that what's going on in your house is crazy. You know what I'm saying? But you don't know otherwise. Exactly. And then especially if you're kept away from other kids, you can't, you know, go into their environment. Exactly. So uh, that's why, that's why I had to, you know, stop you where you were going and say, not his whole life, but as an Mm -hmm. adult, when you become, and this is why I also give kind of a, an excuse to young adults, like people who are 20, maybe 21, because you're just Mm -hmm. now coming out and you're seeing the world and you're realizing that whatever was going on in your house, if it was bad or whatever, was absolute bull crap. Because there are people whose parents sexually abuse them. And I'm telling you, some of these children think this is normal. Some of these children children think this is what it's supposed to be because their parents are telling them, right. you know, I mm-hmm. love you, whatever their parents, whatever crap they're... And they think that's actually exactly. love too. So he decided like, you know, let's try and find out why this happened to me. And maybe if we find out why this happened to me, this could help other people not do it. So um, they actually wrote back and forth trying to find out what was in his mind, what was going on, blah, blah, blah. And the doctor asked him a bunch of questions. And this actually turned into a book, a book that he does not get paid for, meaning Thomas doesn't get any residuals or any money for it. And Mm -hmm. the book is called, it's a nonfiction book, it's called Survived by One, The Life and Mind of Mm -hmm. a Family Mass Murderer. So that's what came out of it. It's actually on Amazon. Um, I thought about buying it, but I was like, eh. I did it. Oh, like, wow. I don't know if I'd get through it because I would be so angry. Yeah, I, I kind of like, you know, kind of didn't mm-hmm. want to read it because just in doing the research for this case, I, I, I just I couldn't. I just couldn't because it's like <sighs> to me, it's like, OK, I hear everything you're saying and that you were going to go kill yourself. But at the same time, you're still alive. And then again, on the other hand, I, everything you're saying, but you strangled your little brother until, quote, yeah, your hands were just, tired. Uh, and then again, I hear everything you're saying, but then you did what you did to your sister and then your brother and you took them to the room like surprise. And Yeah, surprise. You're going to die. Like, oh, my God. Like, oh, who does like that? he took Ugh. his little sister to the room with her, his hands covering her eyes saying, I have a surprise for you. That's why I kind of wow. called bull crap on everything he's saying right it's just i just bull crap to me i just i cannot i understand he's sitting there like trying to figure out why i did this da, 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 da. but it's like the steps you took 
And they're trying to say, well, he was in a rage fuel. No, he had hours between these things where he. Well, like you said, to take your time to wash the clothes three times in a load and dry them and take your time and button your shirt and putting it back on and changing, switching those jeans out again. Like, Chilling oh with my your gosh. girlfriend. If you were, yeah, oh, in, part, if you were in some kind of rage fuel, blah, 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 it would have been everybody. Everybody yeah, would have taken it. That's why I said out. he did. It, the girlfriend wasn't. Yeah. Oh, thank God. But she was like not touched. And I'm not saying she should have been. I'm just saying. No, I know. But it doesn't make sense how he's uh, isolated yeah, yeah, her. Yeah. And then even in, in, even decided to attack and kill the siblings when they had nothing to do with any of this. But she, but he, but he spared his girlfriend. Maybe he felt like she was the only one in the world who truly actually loved him or something. His brother, which is a I'm different pretty type of sure love, his but... brother, who's going through the same abuse. So you had, yeah, you, you had think. a connection there where you all understand each other. I, I, yeah, I, that's why I'm not buying the whole. Maybe he thought this was the only person in the world who loved. No, no, you had your brother yeah. who had a connection with you, even though it was a connection based off of your your freaking sick ass parents. But you had a brother yeah. who had a connection with you. So it just a bunch of this just isn't sitting right with me. I just I don't like it. So I didn't want to buy the book because I didn't want to get even more angry. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So they're saying he's sitting on death row with, quote, extreme regret and guilt over his crime. I, I guess. I don't know. Uh, and the doctor is saying that, you know, he was in a, quote, homicidal state of mind. Um, and this is why he did it. And it's just, all of this is just, I don't know. So I'll just end this by saying, quote, beyond that, he feels shame, not only for what he did with his life and the murders of his family, but how it affected his community and other, other relatives, friends of the family and mm-hmm. teachers. Everyone knew his family and the monumental crime. So this is how I'm going to end it. And that is the rotten, terrible, horrible, disgusting case of Thomas Odell. He's spending the rest of his life in prison and his entire family is dead. If you like this episode and if you didn't, I don't know, if you got as pissed off as I did. <laughs> yes, me too. I, I just, I'm beyond that. I'm just so disgusted. Oh, I, 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 selfishness. That, I just, that's I can't key even. Word in this. I can't even. Mm-hmm. Anyways, if you feel like we do, then head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and rate us five stars. You can download Good Pods and rate us on there too. You can say whatever you want in the description. I can't even do the, the end in normal because I'm so angry right now. <laughs> it's just a sad oh. case, guys. It really is. So forgive me for not sounding mm-hmm. as animated as, as I normally do in our outro, but just, you're going to have to forgive me on this one. Anyway, so you can say whatever you want in the description, but it helps bring us up in the charts so other people could find us just like you did. Don't forget to visit us on Patreon to become an exclusive member of the l and community. You get commercial-free, full-length episodes of Love and Murder. So basically this episode, um, but you would get it without the commercial, commercial and probably some other unedited stuff out of there. So if I edited anything out of this episode, you would get the unedited, like Kai Kirsten because this thing pissed me off. Anyways, you also get bonus content like cases about love obsessions or cases about the craziest crimes or our serial killer corner or we are our upcoming uh, bonus episode is a crazy, crazy, crazy relationship question where somebody's uh, 21 year old daughter is walking around kind of uh, naked in front of her stepfather and what should she do? So if you want to hear stuff like that, then, you know, you can head on over to our Patreon. All of this starts at only $3 a month. So now's the time to get into this exclusive community. We are also following the Johnny Depp case with a special guest host from our No Conduct days. So if you want to hear that, if you're a previous fan of No Conduct and you want to hear from our previous host, then head on over 
to our Patreon. Right now we have two Johnny Depp's episodes in there and one update coming by the end of this week. So join us now. You don't want to miss it. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Follow us on social media at facebook.com forward slash relationship crime. Instagram at love, love murder podcast. Join our Facebook fan group by searching love and murder fan page in Google or Facebook or by simply simply clicking in the link below in the show notes. Find our merch by going to our website www.loveandmurder.com and just go to our shop. I don't feel like plugging all of this because I just this case I just I know I'm just so done this case was yeah, just I don't feel like plugging all of this oh, it was really dark but anyways um go ahead and share yeah, this episode really... with your family and your friends and as always I'm just gonna go ahead and end this episode with our slogan of saying all, all love and, and no murder, murder y'all please no murder y'all love your Peace families out, and be careful be safe good night 